Okay. Let's go. Uh, greetings, friends. It's Chapo. Monday, February 21st. In just a little bit, I will be speaking with uh, Shrecho Horvat, a philosopher and member of the Progressive International, about this week's upcoming Belmarsh Tribunal in New York City about um, basically uh, all the war crimes that the United States and UK governments have committed over the last uh, couple decades and the fact that the only people in jail for them are those who blow, blew the whistle. So just in a little bit, I'll be having a conversation about that. But until then, joining me, as always, Matt and Felix. Hello, friends. How are you? Hey. 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 Well, okay. Uh, I guess just kick things off on Monday. Boy, oh boy, does it look like tensions continue to mount between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we're being told, uh, once again, it didn't happen last week, but I'm being told now that war is definitely going to happen this week. Uh, fellas, who you got? Um, you know, uh, people are talking uh, Russia a lot. Uh, the one history fact they know, because it's the one thing that they ever learned in an American high school. Dude, dude don't invade Russia in the winter. We get it. That's the that's the one thing you you picked up. Um, but I don't think really Russia or Ukraine want it badly enough. I think uh, if there's one country that has shown that they want it, it's Belarus. I mean, I, I guess like I mean, the only news here is that you know Putin says that they're going to recognize the breakaway republics. I don't know. I mean, it just. Uh we, we, I mean, it's just like we spent all last week with people saying that, like, it's going to happen Wednesday, 530 p.m. And now it's been like kicked off to this week, but it's definitely going to happen this week. Like I said, uh, I don't have much to say about it um, other than I would prefer it if uh, war didn't happen. But, you know, what, what, what can you do? What can you say? Let me let me actually let me ask you guys about this. Back to a favorite topic of ours. Did you happen to see the uh, clips uh, from this weekend's 60 Minutes expose on Havana Syndrome where they revealed the Havana Syndrome noise? This former official, who we agreed not to name, recorded the sound at his home in Havana. Before we play it, understand that the sound does not cause the injury. It is a byproduct, like the sound of a gun, which is not what does the harm. Here's what he recorded. The injured officials we spoke with said the sound, or a feeling of pressure, came from one direction and focused in one location. There was a, a continuous sound and uh, one that only changed based on my location. They left, it dissipated. They returned, it recurred. Uh, I didn't listen because I was afraid of getting it. Well, they assured you that just like listening to the noise, as, as Scott Pelley said, Listening to the noise is like listening to, the, to a gunshot. You know, the sound of the gun doesn't hurt you. It's the bullet going into you. So listening to the sounds of what, I don't know, to me sounds exactly like crickets um, actually can't harm you. It so sounds like to, crickets, I have to say. Well, it's, it's weird. It's like listening to the noise on 60 Minutes presents no, no risk to your, your brain getting fried. But listening to them in real life, that same sound, if you were like a, uh, a CIA uh, agent or whatever... Um, like that's deadly or at least just gives you gives you a headache or whatever it gives you a tummy ache it, it, it gives you the swimmies it gives you the sunday scaries it gives you uh imposter syndrome all that good shit but yeah i mean it it, it sounded exactly like crickets it, it sounded it sounded like these people were just like left dc for the first time and uh heard heard you know outdoor noises i mean this this is indoor kids they're they're, they're suffering now because they heard um you know like a a, a coyote the lonesome wail of a coyote wafting across the plains, and it gave them um, just yeah brain brain attack. They heard God's judgment whispering in the wind, and it uh, it made them feel nauseous, and they decided to blame it on. Uh, I guess at this point, is I don't even know if they have a theory as to where the hell it comes from, right? Because it can't just be the Cubans. I guess like the Cubans and the Russians together doing it everywhere. Because apparently now they're saying it's happening here too in the U.S. It's spreading. Can these guys just like make like most people that God talks to and kill themselves? Because I'm, I'm I'm so sick of hearing about this. I'm so sick of it. Their tummies hurt, Felix. I mean, welcome to my reality. You know, where's my parade? <laughs> and it's funny. I mean, the uh, I'm, I'm I said this earlier, but um, 
the the sixty minutes report about Havana syndrome. Uh, they talk to all these uh, whistleblowers like they do, but um, curiously did not talk to a single uh, doctor or scientist. <laughs> um, so it was just these people like telling their accounts. And I, all I got to say is I just happened by like luck of the draw. I watched uh, Michael Mann's The Insider this weekend. And man, oh, man, what a prophetic movie that is. I mean, fucking 60 minutes, man. Yeah, good journalism. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, now here, here we go. This is uh, this, this is what I wanted to read in the the first half of the show here today. This is this is a, this is an op ed in the Washington Post that um, uh, came out in. All right, this, fuck, this is no good. Uh, I'm sorry, gang. I'm 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 uh, I mean, I did I did this interview, but I I uh, I don't know what to talk about today other than this interview here. So, fuck. I mean, can we give me like ten minutes to throw something together here? I mean, like I I just feel like I got my dick in my hand right now. All right. Uh, the AARP weekly news quiz. <laughs> okay, all right. All right. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Felix. So uh, it's come to my attention that um, the minimum age of this show is 63 years old. It's the age of the youngest member, me. I was born in 1963. All these other gentlemen, they met in the Korean War. Uh, 75 like, years young. We're all we're 75 years young. We were all the inspiration for Tom of Finland's amazing drawings. Uh, we all met in the Merchant Marine and uh, started a little thing called Chapo Trap House. But, you know, with, with age uh, comes changes, comes responsibilities. And it's high time that we, you know, drop the DSA or PSL memberships and we, we, we join the real vanguard of leftism in America, the ideology of leftism, the AARP. I have found the AARP weekly news quiz, and I will be administering it to my 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 fellow seniors. All right, I just need to take my Centrum senior first. I hold on, hold on. My my balls are caught in my craftmatic. <laughs> if I have okay. trouble answering any of these questions, it's only because I have a mouthful of Werther's originals that I couldn't pawn off on my <laughs> selfish grandchildren. I have I have Werther's three. They have hydrocodone in them. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we recently reported about portable medical order forms that give you that give the seriously ill more control over their care. What are those forms called? <laughs> DAF forms, POLST forms, ICD-10 forms, or C-27 forms? Uh, I don't know. C-27. That sounds right. I, that's uh, got a good feeling for me. I'm going okay. with the uh, D-46. D All right. D-46 uh, we'll, forms. It was not an answer, but we're, we're going to see. Matt was first. It was uh, P-O-L-S to Pulsed. So the, the slash pull forms, the based forms. The title is an acronym for Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Ah, that's damn in, it. That's, yeah, that's encouraging. Okay. Uh, true or false? Hearing loss is three times as common in people with diabetes than in people the same age without the disease. I'm saying true. Yeah, that sounds about, that sounds true. Makes sense. Yeah. This is like, this is clearly like a, a question for people with dementia because it's like, why would you phrase it that way if that was false? Yeah. Okay. To false. It's actually twice. As oh, <laughs> fuck. They got us. God damn it. Damn, this is so fucking hard. Ah, uh, curse you, AARP. Remember, remember the New York Times end of the year quiz that we did that was like for fucking babies? It was just like, how many states are in America? Yeah, we're getting roasted by these old fucks. God damn it. Yeah. The New York Times quiz was like, you know, uh, how many how many states are there in America? And it was a multiple choice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what color this, is this? Yeah, this is like actually hard. This is like giving me flashbacks to failing bio. <laughs> so wait a second. So. If you're diabetic, you're not at any greater risk of going deaf. No, no it's twice as much, not three. That that's the trick. Oh, it's, they gotcha. Oh, okay, I, I get it. All right, damn it. I was I was I was getting ready to just you know not worry about that as as I turn seventy six. More than three quarters of this Atlanta area church's congregation were fully vaccinated as of mid February, thanks in part to its outreach efforts, as we reported in a recent article. Uh, is it the Grace Place Church of God by Faith? Um, <laughs> I hope it's that one because I really like the name of that. Yeah, it's, it just rolls it's, gra off the it's trunk. Grace Place Church by God. It's like, you know, Mark Jacobs by Mark in collaboration <laughs> yeah, with Mark Jacobs. Yeah, the God Collection. Uh, <laughs> New Covenant Church. That's pretty boring. Vic that sucks. 
Get, yeah, get a better name. Uh, Victory Church, better or... than Loser Church, certainly. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're well. You're gonna love. You're gonna love this final one. This is like um, this is a church where your pastor like uh, wears Abercrombie. A uh, resonate church. <laughs> resonate <laughs> church. <laughs> is that the show? Is that the is that the one Justin Bieber goes to? Yeah, uh, I, that sounds like it. I know the I know the church where no one's vaccinated, and it's resonate church. No one is. No one has got. You get kicked out of resonate if you get the shot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I'm. I'm. They saying, say that your vibes are off and you're excommunicated. I'm saying it's <laughs> it's it's God's place. Okay. Okay, Matt. Uh, the first one, God's the Grace Place, place Church Grace of God place. by Faith. <laughs> God That's by one. Fa- Faith by God in collaboration mm. with God. All right, let's let's see. Ooh, all right, our first correct answer. It's Faith Place. Mm-hmm. Hell Grace yeah, Grace Place. All right, all right. Yeah. So what, what, what's uh, what's the story there? They got they got their parishioners vaccinated. Uh, the church is located in Clayton County, Georgia, where fewer than forty four percent of the res- residents were fully vaccinated as of mid February. I, I know what we're doing on our off day in Atlanta. We're going to the Grace Place. Yeah, now, we're sucking uh, the vaccine out. <laughs> now they all got to go to hell. Congratulations to them. Enjoy they enjoy would. roasting for eternity for failing to have faith and taking Satan's number. Way to go. Yep. They've got the mark of the beast. But I mean, the cool thing about the mark of the beast, though, is that it means that you can buy and sell anything. It's true. You can be on yeah. your grind. Yeah, your Bitcoin wallet is always accessible. Yeah. The recent films, The Tragedy of Macbeth, Malcolm and Marie, and Belfast are very different, but they do have this in common. They're, They're all black, black and white. white. They're all black and white. Yes. Okay. Well, that that's one of the. Uh, should I just pick that? Yeah. Black yeah. And white? Okay. What are okay. the other? What are the other options though? Well, the other options were Zendaya stars and all of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, that they were produced for Netflix and their soundtracks were nominated for. Well, an Oscar. I I know Zendaya is not in all of those movies. No, so yeah, they're, they're black she, and she's white. Not, yeah. She's not. She's uh, not Macbeth. <laughs> that's really playing on the on the confusion of the usual people taking this test <laughs> yeah, where they yeah. <laughs> think most actresses are Zendaya now. Yeah. Yeah. They're shot in black and white. That is two. We have two correct answers. Hell yes. The way through. Killing it now. All right. Now, now this is when they start fucking with you. Longtime foster mother, Linda Owens of Hayward, California had nurtured this many children as of mid February, according to our profile of her nurtured them. What does that mean? I think like grew them. <laughs> like they were on a towel and sort of like grew out. Um, is it 37? Is it 52, 83, or 104? <laughs> okay, I, I just think like by the uh, sort of like the, the, the way the answers are given, because like the, the first one, 37, I'm like, holy shit, that's a lot of kids. But I think they're... I think they're fr- they're faking you out. I think the actual number is 104. Yeah, my instinct is always yeah. to go with the highest in these kind of things. Yeah, because nurtured, if adopted, would be one thing, right? Because right, nurturing, then, like, big deal. Like, so give somebody a fucking uh, Valentine's card. I could nurture someone that I see, like, twice in a decade. Yeah, I can nurture from uh, long distance. Like, I could do... I could do like tactical sniping style uh, nurturings yeah, 500 I'm, yards away. I'm, I'm playing catch with all of my foster kids in the metaverse. They don't live with me, <laughs> but I am nurturing them. All right, I'm going to check this answer. It's 83. Ah, okay. So we, we, we aim too high because like, you know, 104, that's a ludicrous number, but 83 realistic. So who, who is this person and how do they nurture all these kids? Well, they only have a quote from her here. I'm going to Google her in a second. Uh, being able to care for these babies is a gift from God and I will do it as long as God gives me the will and the strength and the help to do it. She told the AARP. Still not how it's happening. Yeah. Okay. So this is a foster mom. Okay. And there are like a lot of local news articles about her where they're like the nicest woman in the world. She looks, as you would expect, like the nicest foster mom in the world to look. Yeah. She has like, um, you know, sort of like cat glasses. She's very grandmotherly. Um, I don't really have anything bad to say about her. Yeah, no, keep her. it up. She's good doing her own work. Yeah. In, in group DMs, she's getting torched. <laughs> but, you know, here, I'm nice to her. Okay. Uh, workers 65 and older. This is us. Yep. Uh, with qualifying incomes have recently been made eligible for the earned income tax credit. Ooh. Which of these statements about the EITC is true? It reduces the tax you owe dollar for dollar. Some states have their own version of the EITC. This is a one-year change as of now or all of the above. All of the above. I'm going to go with all of the above. All of the above. It's got to be all of the above. Yeah. 
Boom. Correct. You will never uh, fucking trick us with that, motherfuckers. It's you always all of the above. The all of it's the above. always all yeah. of the above. That's those of you out there who are taking like the ACTs or you know whatever you take now. It's probably a new thing. They probably make you play Digimon against an anti-racism instructor. <laughs> but uh, if any of the Digimon cards say all of the above, play that one. Yes. Uh, did you guys take the ACTs or the SATs? ACTs. ACTs for me as well. Oh, wow. Take the SATs. That, I, I don't know. Someone told me that the ACTs were swagger. No, that's the one they give you in the Midwest. Yeah. That Is might it? be different now, but... Uh, yeah, Catherine took the ACTs. Yeah. Well, the ACTs had like a writing portion. And if you were an artistic, expressive child like me, you know, you, you went crazy on that. Do you remember what, what the writing portion was, what the essay question you, you had to respond to was? Actually, no. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. No. no. <laughs> I don't remember I, either. I, I don't. I saw an adult uh, on Twitter bragging about getting a 32 on their AC2s. The other wow, day. that's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, I mean... I do not remember what I got on them. Do not remember the essay that I wrote, which I'm sure is one of the best essays in the history of the ACT. But th this person remembered, you know, good for them. I got a mediocre score on the ACT. And then uh, I just took it again without doing anything in the interim to like study or specifically try to improve my score. And I got the exact same score. Yeah. Because like, um, go. try hard. Yeah. I mean, like I, I think like in general, you do better at things you don't care about or like Absolutely. can convince yourself you don't care about, you know? Yeah. It's like right? getting girls. It's like, it's like attracting ladies. Yeah. The most out of my league girls I've ever gotten. I did the same thing I did when I did great on the ACT. I walked in there <laughs> and I said, I don't care if I go to college and you're disgusting. <laughs> looked at the, looked at the proctor and said, you're disgusting. You're repulsive. I would not touch you. And I got, and I, I do, and the, the proctor of that test was actually Alexandra Daddario, and I smoked her out, and I got a 37 <laughs> on my ACTs, and I aced the writing portion. Okay. True or false? According to a driving safety expert, you shouldn't use cruise control when driving in the rain. Uh, <laughs> true. True. Sounds good. You should, yeah, I mean, it, it, you should, you should, I learned in driver's ed, you need to, you should always drive. The speed that the conditions uh, allow for. So, I mean, like, you know, like going uh, 65, 70, if it's pouring rain, you may be driving the speed limit, but you're not actually driving the car in a safe manner. So I'd imagine, you know, even, you know, your open highway, cruise control, you think you may zone out. I, I would say that it is um, incorrect to use cruise control um, that um, insouciantly um, in the middle of a rain or hailstorm. Yeah, cruise control is really only, and you learn this in any driving safety class, especially one for seniors, like we all take, only for when you're drunk. It's a true, dude. Good work, good work, guys. I was not gonna knock that one out of the park. I never, I never, I never use cruise control. I think, I think it's, I think it's the a tool of the devil. It's for lazy people. Yeah, no, I mean, it seems like something for truck drivers. Which of these is not among the symptoms of a brain tumor? That we listed in a recent Oh boy. Article. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Uh, new or unusual headache? I'm just going uh, on. Have I experienced these things in the last month? Um, unusual, dry, or flaky skin? Oh, fuck. Confusion or loss of awareness? God damn it. I'm just checking every box going down yeah, this list. Yeah, these all there. sound pretty brain tumor y. At least right. the first per and the third one certainly do. I don't know about the uh, flaky skin. Personality changes. So only one of these is no, uh, it not is not. Uh, it's not. Oh, the skin one, obviously. Yeah, it's the skin That's one. That's too easy. All right. Yeah. Okay. Hey, which which okay, which symptom well, that is not of uh, involves your brain? The doy. Well, I'm I'm glad to find this out because you know I have dry flaky skin and I was getting ready to you know basically write a will. <laughs> yeah, uh, my personality has completely changed in the last week, but uh, I don't have any of the others. Okay. Score 63%. You answered five out of eight questions correctly. So we did pretty good. Honestly, that's a passing grade. I mean, considering that we're not in the AARP, that's really good. Does it have, it should have like which type of old person you are based on your score. Like, yeah, I don't know why they don't do that. You are. Yeah, it should like if you're like 80 to 100%, you're Clint. Yeah. If you're 60 to 80%, you're Joe. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the lower, the failing ranks of old people are. Presumably, presumably you like, you. this is tough because like if you fail it, you either ha have dementia, which like makes you very old, or you're like just not an old head at all. 
you know, you're not reading the AARP magazine. So it, it really could go either way. But I think, um, you know, I'm pretty happy we passed. This is like going into an AP class and passing the end of year test. Yeah. We're going to have so many parties at the AP, AARP frats. Oh, my. Yeah. I'm an AARP pike. I can't wait to uh, celebrate this by uh, getting drunk and um, driving my uh, villages style golf cart on cruise control in the rain. I think the AARP guys are like, um, yeah, you kind of have to respect them as like, uh, you know, do we still use this term? The best special interest lobby in America. They're always getting shit for old people. That's true. The old people stay getting their bag. Thanks to the AARP. Mm hmm. It's what do you why think, yeah. uh, Social Security is the is the third rail of American politics. And did you know that actually uh, there was like a right wing alternative to the AARP that that cropped up? Like, uh, you know, they, they, it was a new lobbying group that was like for seniors, but who wanted to cut Social Security benefits. <laughs> it didn't take off, as you might imagine. <laughs> That's tough. The AARP is clouded um, because, you know. If you're an old person that's still alive, like if you made it to old age, you are you're a you're a voting ass guy. You're one voting ass guy or girl. And that's why this news quiz was like very specific, because I mean, like ARP, like that that's a big that's a big crossover with news heads. Yeah. If you're old, you're a voter, you're a news head and you're an old head. You're that old head that's always always coming around and, uh, you know. Coming, you know, going to the porch and being like, "Hey, hey, youngsters, true or false? It's you should <laughs> drive with cruise control in the rain." <laughs> well, there you go. Um, uh, uh, thank you for administering the test, Felix. Uh, we have passed. We are officially old people. I would like my AARP starter jacket to be sent to me in the mail, uh, along with my Teamsters jacket. Still waiting on that one. Um, but we should we 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 need some swag from the AARP, or I think maybe they have like a sponsorship that they could do with us. I mean, they, they got to start. They got to start advertising to younger members now. Yeah, they got to get people ready. Like, hey, hey, uh, hey, all you millennials! Pretty soon, you're gonna have to be gumming your avocado toast. So get ready for it. Yeah, uh, the youngest millennial. They should, is, they should offer supreme branded adult diapers. Yeah, I mean it's time. Like the youngest millennial is 49 years old. Yeah. Um, if you were, you know, want to feel old, if you were born in 1990, you just turned uh, 72. Yep. It's time. All right, uh, gang, gang. Um, all right, let's 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 transition into my uh, interview for this week. Um, it is, as I mentioned at the top of the show, of uh, Srecho Horvat, um, who is a part putting together um, the Belmarsh Tribunal, which uh, kicks off on Friday in New York City. Uh, it's basically, you know, an, an attempt by you know many thinkers, activists, and um, uh, political figures, including a friend of the show, Stephen Donzinger. Um, who will essentially sent to hold to account and put on trial at sort of a people's tribunal uh, all of the uh, war criminals responsible for Guantanamo Bay, the war in Iraq, uh, the ongoing imprisonment of uh, Julian Assange and other whistleblowers like him. Um, it was an interesting interview and uh, I think a, an important cause. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, let's move into that. Strecho Horvat of the Progressive International and the uh, Belmarsh Tribunal. So um, let's go there. <laughs> Joining me uh, today is philosopher and member of the Progressive International, Srecho Horvat, who is here to talk about the um, about the Belmarsh Tribunal. Srecho, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. So, um, I guess could you just introduce the um, the Belmarsh um, Belmarsh Tribunal and um, uh, when it's happening and what it's uh, all about? Yeah, I mean, maybe we could perhaps start from the very name, Belmarsh Tribunal. What the fuck does it mean? You know, what is Belmarsh? Uh, I think Guantanamo, of course, or Abu Ghraib uh, are much more famous or infamous, to be more precise, all across the world. Uh, but Belmarsh is a prison in the United Kingdom, in southeast London. Uh, and uh, it's a prison which is being called the British Guantanamo, uh, namely uh, because of its severe conditions and also because some of the detainees are there for an indefinite period of time uh, after the 9-11 anti-terror laws. But it's also at the same time the prison where uh, the WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange is being held. Uh, so we decided uh, two years ago at the Progressive International to found a people's tribunal uh, which would take the name of uh, the prison where Julian Assange is being held in order to turn the tables, uh, to put the mirror to actually to the real criminals, to the real war criminals, and to do, and to speak and to examine 
the war crimes which were revealed by Julian Assange, namely the war crimes in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in Guantanamo, and in many, many other places. So on the 25th of February, on Friday, we are coming to New York City, uh, where we are having a new session of the Belmarsh Tribunal. We will be joined by former uh, Guantanamo detainees, for instance, uh, Mohamed Wal Slahi. Uh, perhaps he might be now more famous because of the movie Mauri Ma Mauritanian, you know, with uh, Jody Foster, uh, which is about him and Nancy Hollander, the, the courageous lawyer who defended him, who will also be in New York. Uh, Stephen Donzinger, uh, Roger Waters, Yanis Varoufakis, Cornel West, uh, many, many, many other people. Uh, and, and this was um, sort of uh, inspired by a tribunal that was originally convened during the uh, Vietnam War by uh, Bertrand Russell and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, precisely. Uh, so we and also many other tribunals all across the world were inspired by this co courageous tribunal by, founded by two philosophers, once, one from Britain and the other one from France, as you said, uh, Russell and Sartre, uh, which was founded in 1966 uh, with an attempt uh, to put the United States government on trial because of the war crimes in Vietnam. Uh, and it, it, it included uh, very famous, important people of the 20th century. Besides Sartre and Russell, it was Simone de Beauvoir, Tariq Ali, Isaac Deutscher, Vladimir Dedier from Yugoslavia, Peter Weiss uh, from Germany, many others. Uh, they had uh, a few sessions. The first one was in, Cop in, in Stockholm in 1967. The second one was in, uh, in in Copenhagen or near Copenhagen uh, the year after. And it was under a lot of pressure, actually, we have to say, uh, from uh, the, the secret intelligence of the United States, like CIA or Rand Corporation. They were like regularly following what the members of the Russell Tribunal were doing. At one moment, there was even a geopolitical scandal, diplomatic scandal, because uh, the co-chair of the Russell Tribunal, Vladimir Dedier, uh, wasn't admitted to France. Uh, uh, at that time, which was very, very interesting because the goal at that time was actually against the war in Vietnam. So after that, they tried to do their tribunal in, in Britain, where the Labour government blocked it. And in the end, they did it in Sweden. Uh, so this is the legacy of the Rasa Sartre tribunal. And I think 50 years later, today, what we have to do is to speak about the crimes of the early 20th century. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, recently, there was a recent report published uh, on the price of the global war on terror, uh, which was you know, initiated by George W. Bush uh, after 9-11 in 2001. And the price, according to this report of the war on terror, is 38 million displaced people. 38 million displaced people, which is the biggest number since the Second World War of displaced people in the world. And all these people are displaced because the United States government had its fingers uh, in eight different countries, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, the Philippines, Libya, and Syria. And, you know, no one has ended up in prison because of this crime. No one has ended up in prison because of the torture in Abu Ghraib in Guantanamo. Guantanamo. No one has ended up in prison uh, uh, because of the WikiLeaks revelations about the crimes which were committed. And this is the main idea of the tribunal, which, was, which will happen in, the, in New York City. Yeah, I mean, this this to me seems to be the uh, the central question here is that, you know, what what do we do as, you know, citizens of, I guess, like nominally democratic countries? I mean, what do we do with a situation in which the United States and gov the governments of the United States and Great Britain have more or less openly committed war crimes for decades now? Um, and certainly before that. But, you know, you're talking about indefinite detention, torture, murder, wars of aggression. Um, and then and then like the reality is the only people, as you mentioned, who have been sent to jail over these crimes are people who blew the whistle like Julian Assange, like Chelsea Manning and others like the uh, the Mauritanian who was just, you know, caught up in this dragnet um, post war on terror. So, like, obviously, we can't rely on the government itself or the media because they're complicit as well. So, I mean, like, it just, it, what, are, what are some of, like, the, the, the charges that, you, I mean, are going to be presented here? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. And uh, exactly, unfortunately, as you said, uh, those who are in prison or, or who disappeared or who are being slowly killed uh, are precisely the whistleblowers, are precisely the truth tellers uh, from Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, Daniel Hale, Stephen Donzinger. I mean, the list is pretty, pretty long. Uh, but what you have uh, in the United States, and that's one of the reasons why 
the progressive international is coming to the United States is a sort of cynicism. You know, how often has the liberal uh, United States media spoken about Navalny, for instance? You know, how often can you these, right. these days, for instance, hear about the impending invasion of Russia into Ukraine? You know, it's tomorrow. No, no, no. It's at 2 p.m. next day. No, it's at midnight. <laughs> you know, constantly they're speaking about the invasion. But come on. Shouldn't we speak about the invasion of the United States into Afghanistan, Iran, if you go back into history, uh, which actually, you know, also in Afghanistan previously. It's very interesting that the Ma Ma Mauritanian whom you mentioned, Mohamed Wolslah, he was actually fighting on the side of the United States, you know, in, uh, against the Soviets. And so they imprisoned this guy later. Uh, and they put him through torture, which was, of course, approved by Donald Rumsfeld, which is, you know, waterboarding, sleep deprivation, isolation, sexual sexual accumulation. And he stays in Guantanamo for 15 years without charges. Julian Assange is already free for three years in, in the British Guantanamo without charges. He has been for six, seven years at the Ecuadorian embassy because he has revealed these crimes. So your question, what can the public do? You know, what can we do? Uh, is a pertinent question. And what we are trying to do is to shed light on actually what those individuals, but also people uh, who are in a way uh, united or getting united, uh, uh, what these people actually revealed. And I think that's very important. Of course, uh, we don't think that uh, uh, that we have the capacity, capacity to sentence the accused. And that's not our ambition. That also wasn't the ambition of the Russell Sartre Tribunal to, to, to sentence the accused. Uh, uh, what we want to do is actually to create a sort of tribunal uh, which can shed light on the crimes, uh, which can provoke a public debate, which, which can provoke uh, political pressure, uh, not just in the United States, but across the world. Because I think, you know, as the Rand Corporation said in some of their uh, leaked documents, uh, which were uh, recently declassified, uh, they said that the Russell Sartre Tribunal was an embarrassment uh, for the United States because it showed what kind of crimes the United States committed. And in that way, I also think the Belmarsh Tribunal is a sort of embarrassment for the United States. Uh, but that's just the first step. What we hope to provoke is a bigger coalition, is a bigger pressure of people and movements who are not just from the United States, but from all across the world. Um, I want to return again to the uh, the title of the tribunal, uh, named after Belmarsh Prison, which, as you uh, described it, is probably the most notorious prison in the UK. You've described it as Britain's Guantanamo. It is currently where uh, Julian Assange is being held, awaiting extradition to the United States. Um, what are what are the charges and like sort of arguments advanced by the British state to justify imprisoning him? And what is the like the reason the, the United States is demanding that he be extradited and charged under like the Espionage Act? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's it, it also shows uh, uh, a scandal in, in the legal system, but also politics of the United Kingdom, because, you know, it's not just the United States. It's United Kingdom. It's Australia. It was Ecuador. Uh, and it's. Of course, then the United States, which were complicit in silencing and isolating Julian Assange. Uh, you know, what was recently re revealed was that the CIA uh, had secret plans to kidnap him from the Ecuadorian embassy at the time when he was still there, uh, also to murder him there. Uh, and the United Kingdom, on the basis of uh, Julian Assange skipping bail in 2012, <laughs> in 2012, skipping bail, you know, because he was at house arrest at that time uh, for the very same reasons as he is in prison today, uh, uh, trying to escape uh, the extradition to the United States, because that actually means a death sentence for him. Uh, and he skipped bail. And that's basically the legal reason, uh, uh, the legal basis why the United Kingdom is uh, keeping him at the British Guantanamo. At the same time, uh, the United States uh, wants him for the United States government, of course. It's not the American people who want him in, in, in a high security prison. It's the United States government. Uh, uh, wants Assange in a high security prison, Supermax prison, uh, for violating the Espionage Act, uh, which is also completely ridiculous. Uh, because first of all, he's an Australian citizen. Uh, second, uh, he, he wasn't a whistleblower. He's a publisher. So he leaked material which was uh, provided to him. And the things which he provided to the public uh, is something uh, which is so valuable, especially for uh, the citizens of the United States, because it shows how the United States government violated 
the law. And if the United States government can violate the law like that, or if they can put Julian Assange in prison and then extradite him to the United States, then no journalist is safe. No dissident is safe. No one who criticizes the capitalist system. Take Stephen Donzinger, you know, that's another recent case where you can see that someone who is fighting against Chevron, destroying the Amazon, uh, also faces persecution, isolation, uh, and silence. Um, I mean, like this issue about um, Assange being a publisher, I think is very critical because, I mean, like, for instance, like what arguments would say like the New York Times make as to why what they do as a like a function of their as an institutional purpose is fundamentally different from what Julian Assange did and is being charged with espionage for. And like speaking more broadly, I mean, like you, you talked about a little bit, like what are the implications for if Assange were able to be convicted under the Espionage Act for doing espionage against the United States of America, a country he's not even a citizen of. Yeah, I mean, the the the, the effects uh, of this uh, legal precedent, but also political, it's a political case, uh, would be that any journalist of the New York Times, of Washington Post, but also a podcaster, uh, could end up uh, uh, in, in prison. Uh, and not just podcasters or journalists from American soil, but from wherever, you know, from France, uh, from, from Spain, from Latin America, from, from Africa, from Asia, uh, they could face the same uh, fate as Julian Assange. So, uh, and of course, Julian is not the first one. I mean, we've seen what happened to Edward Snowden, uh, who, of course, wasn't a publisher in the sense of Julian Assange. He was a whistleblower. Uh, but it's also a case where you have someone actually contributing to democracy, contributing uh, uh, to uh, the citizens knowing what kinds of crimes are going on, not only against other countries, but against the citizens themselves. Just remember what kind of uh, surveillance programs Edward Snowden revealed, or also WikiLeaks in the World 7 uh, uh, Leaks, uh, which was about the CIA surveillance program, you know? So it is something which concerns all of us. And I think if Julian Assange is extradited to the United States, uh, we will live in very dark times. We already live in very dark times. The Belmarsh Tribunal is happening at the 20th anniversary of Guantanamo. Guantanamo is still open. Uh, we can see all the war machine of the United States uh, uh, preparing invasions or already invading the Pacific, for instance. You know, uh, uh, I can just read about the Russian invasion. What about the ongoing US invasion in the Pacific? Immediately after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when the United States government started nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands, not to mention today in which way you have this kind of Cold War uh, between the United States and China on the hand, one hand and Russia on the other hand, which I think is very dangerous. And it is something which concerns us in Europe a lot, because many countries in Europe, uh, from the north to the south, uh, uh, are in the middle of this geopolitical games uh, which can bring only more suffering and more instability to the world. Um, you mentioned Guantanamo Bay and the fact that like, you know, this is now the anniversary of how long this sort of, uh, you know, indefinite detention and torture facility has been opened in Cuba and operated by the U.S. government. I mean, here in America, it does seem like the, uh, as far as the mainstream press and just general public at large is concerned, uh, the war on terrorism has really faded from the public imagination. And, you know, you mentioned the, the, the example of Russia and Ukraine. Now we're being treated to, you know, that that's the new threat that we all have to be worried about. But like in the background, the machinery of the war on terror continues to just clock along pretty much unabated. And many of the people who were sent there, you know, back in 2002 without trial, without trial or charges are still there right now. Exactly. And it's like it, it's just like the, the Belmar Tribunal is like, you know, I guess. Uh, I don't know, reminding people that like all this stuff is not not a settled issue just because you don't worry, just because like the, the, the press or the public at large doesn't seem to really care about it anymore. Exactly. But it's not just reminding people. It's also putting political pressure in the belly of the beast. You know, this is not just another Zoom, just another online meeting. Yeah. Uh, it's a physical but also hybrid meeting of uh, very influential People uh, like, you know, lawyers and attorneys like Margaret Kunstler, uh, Deborah Herbeck, uh, Nancy Hollander, but also intellectuals such as Cornel West, Noam Chomsky, uh, Tom Morello from the Rage Against the Machine is here who will give a testimony uh, how the music of Rage Against the Machine was used in Guantanamo for torture, you know, which is... <laughs> which is amazing and uh, uh, amazing in a bad sense, you know, and it was the song Killing in the Name of. 
anyone who knows what's the meaning of killing in the name of, and then knowing that it was used in Guantanamo shouldn't sh just be shocked, but anger, you know. Uh, uh, and we will also have many other people. I al already mentioned uh, Stephen Donzinger, but there will also be uh, 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 Mohamed Wolslahi from Guantanamo, Elise Walker, Balthazar Garzon, uh, many others. So I think it's not just reminding, it's a bit more than just reminding uh, that currently you still have 39 uh, uh, detainees in Guantanamo uh, who are still there. Uh, Julian Assange is still in prison. Uh, uh, many other whistleblowers or publishers are facing persecution as we speak. Uh, and the war machine, as you said, uh, is ongoing, you know. I mean, the war on terror never ended. The war on terror is still taking place. And actually, uh, uh, even, you know, if you watched one of those Batmans, you could see that surveillance system, uh, how in which way it is used, uh, 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 you know, advocating democracy. Uh, and this actually, this narrative started with 9-11, you know, in order to preserve democracy, uh, we will invade and penetrate uh, your personal lives. Uh, and today it's, I would say, also much more than the war machine because you have Silicon Valley and very often uh, these companies from Palantir to Google uh, uh, to, to Facebook uh, are actually very often cooperating uh, with uh, uh, the dark deep state, to put it like that, uh, with the secret services. Uh, they were cooperating, Google, for instance, in Syria. Uh, you know, so today, I would say 20 years after opening Guantanamo, we are in a much more dangerous situation. I mean, it's like, you know, the, uh, the and it's just like, it's, it's the question is the implication of all of this, because like once you take on the reality of what, you know, the United States and the UK government not just has done, but continues to do every day. It's just like the, the way in which like the mainstream press is able to sort of metabolize a part of that truth, but never follow up the logical conclusion, which would be that many people at, who are, are in jail right now need to be out of jail. And many people who are currently walking around free and being interviewed on television need to be put in prison for what they did. Exactly. That, that's, you know, that's why I think that uh, your work is so important and the kind of media uh, uh, you present, because I think uh, the mainstream media is always uh, aligned with what Noam Chomsky famously called manufacturing consent. Uh, and today it's also not just the mainstream media anymore. It's the social networks, uh, which are very often uh, manipulating, pre-programming your desire. You know, it's not just about the political economy today, I would say philosophically, to put it philosophically, it's also about the libidinal economy, in which ways new technologies, uh, which were very often uh, developed actually by the military industrial complex or NSA and so on, in which way these technologies are actually capturing our innermost thoughts, our innermost hopes, desires, fears, and in which way they can be manipulated also. Uh, so no wonder that everyone today speaks about just about Russia and Ukraine, while at the same time, you know, people in Yemen are uh, uh, suffering and they are, they are uh, you know, in, in utter hunger, while other countries are going uh, through mega catastrophes, while at the same time we have a climate catastrophe, uh, the nuclear threat never disappeared. Actually, we have a collision between the climate crisis and nuclear threat. Uh, so I think, you know, that's our big duty and also a big challenge for all of us uh, to 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 dive deeper into this and to shed the light on the real problems. I'm not saying the tensions in Russia and Ukraine are not real. I'm not saying they are not worrying me, uh, but this is certainly not uh, the only worrying thing in the world today. Uh, and it's certainly not the only, only pending invasion uh, while we have ongoing invasions already all over the world. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they concern me too. But I mean, just, just, just from what, I've, what I'm experiencing here in, in America is like, at least as it regards Russia and Ukraine right now, there seems to me like in the, in the media and political class, there seems to be this frustration with the public that they're not, you know, getting out in the streets and marching against Russian intervention in Ukraine when these very same people either ignored or slandered the people marching against uh, U.S. intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it seems to be this... This, this idea that it's it's your duty to speak out against the actions of other countries that you you are not a citizen of, but the conduct of your own government and the politicians you theoretically vote for or are subject to you ideally um, is not of your concern. And in fact, like uh, by you singling them out, you're ignoring uh, these more serious problems, or you're not you're not you're not a serious person in some way. 
<laughs> yeah, it reminds me of of uh, of, a, of a famous line by the by the German playwright Bertolt Brecht, uh, uh, who in one of his poems said that the government didn't like uh, how the people voted, uh, so they decided to change the people. <laughs> so uh, uh, actually, uh, you know that that's what ha what's happening in so-called rep representative parliamentary democracies, and also in the United States, but also all over Europe. You know that elected governments. Uh, uh, don't have any kind of uh, uh, commitment or responsibility to, to the citizens themselves. And when the citizens criticize the acts or crimes of their own governments, uh, then those citizens, uh, uh, or even those who are not citizens, uh, like Julian Assange, uh, become dissidents. Uh, so uh, I would say that, you know, reading or following uh, the American media, uh, not just the American media, you have it also in the European liberal media, or censure, censure media, uh, you always have this kind of uh, cynicism, I would say, you know, and uh, always talking about uh, the dissidents of China, the dissidents of Russia, uh, of Saudi Arabia, or I don't know whom, uh, but rarely are people like Snowden, Assange, Daniel Hale, uh, Chelsea Manning actually called dissidents, you know, dissidents in the sense that they are the real patriots, they are the real patriots in the sense that some of them, like Snowden, they, they took the Constitution more seriously than the government of the United States. And that's the reason why he ended up extradited, in a way, uh, from the United States. Why not extradited, but in a way, why he had to escape the United States uh, and get a political asylum. Not because he loves the weather in Russia, you know. Uh, it's, pretty, yeah. it's pretty cold in Russia, uh, <laughs> So as we know. Uh, uh, so I think that's the true problem. So uh, And I think the Belmarsh Tribunal, but also all the people who are in one way or the other way, and it's many, many people already involved in the tribunal or the allies of the Progressive International, different movements. Uh, what we are trying to do is to try to save some of those people if we can. Uh, we know very well from our historic experience that these struggle, struggles take, take years or sometimes decades. You know, how many years uh, did Nelson Mandela need to get free? Uh, uh, you know, of course, I don't want Julian Assange to, to stay in prison for so long because as you might probably know, at the last hearing in October, he had a stroke in prison because, you know, this guy already suffered so much uh, for the last 10, 11 years. He was without son in complete isolation for the last three years in isolation at the embassy. Uh, for what? For revealing war crimes. Uh, and I think we should insist and reiterate the point that this is about the crimes and war crimes uh, of not just the United States government, governments, but also its allies, and that most of those people, you know, Tony Blair, George Bush, many others, are still alive, still free, while the whistleblowers and the dissidents are in prison, or others will also end up in prison. And, you know, uh, while it was going on, I think people had an idea of what um, Assange's situation was like when he was, you know, stuck in the Ecuadorian embassy. But now that he's been removed from there and in custody, it's sort of like, uh, uh, that was the point of it, because his name... And the conditions he's facing has has dropped out of public view. You, I mean, we talked brief about Belmarsh Prison and how notorious it is. Uh, like, of what do we know of the conditions that Assange is currently um, existing in 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 British custody, and what he will face theoretically when extradited to America for espionage? Yeah, I mean, I had the luck to to visit him uh, several times at the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, in London, and I also visited him, and that was the first and last time that I saw him uh, at the Belmarsh prison uh, in early November 2019. Uh, and so I can compare the situation, you know, at the Ecuadorian embassy uh, at uh, that time when I was visiting, uh, he at least had the internet until Lenin Moreno cut the internet uh, because of a deal uh, with the IMF and with the United States. So he was then already the last months before he was kicked out in that brutal way from the Ecuadorian embassy, although he had political asylum until that moment. Uh, uh, you know, before uh, uh, those months, he didn't have internet. He was completely isolated. But at the Ecuadorian embassy during those six, seven years, he could at least have visitors. Uh, he could use the internet. Uh, as you know, WikiLeaks was... Uh, uh, publishing leaks, which were annoying a lot of people, of course. Uh, so even more people 
uh, hated him uh, because of the ca character assassination, which was taking place since the so-called Swedish case. Uh, I mean, there is a great book by Niels Melzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, which was just published, uh, called The Trial of Julian Assange, where he shows in which way also this character assassination functions. You know, we have to say that many among the left uh, uh, believed that Julian Assange was a demon, you know, that we, he was a mo monster. Uh, they actually believed uh, what the intelligence services were putting through different mainstream media or social networks. Uh, but to come to your question, you know, at the Ecuadorian embassy, the conditions were still, although they were really bad, they were still human in a way. Although he couldn't move out of this tiny space, he didn't see the sun for seven years, uh, uh, and he was under constant pressure. But compared to Belmarsh prison, it's very difficult to compare it. You know, I visited Belmarsh prison. It's not that exotic in a way as Guantanamo, you know, uh, uh, that far away or on an island, on Cuba, which, by the way, was also occupied and is still occupied. Uh, uh, but this Belmarsh Guantanamo is in southeast London. You can reach it uh, by tube and train. And you come there and it's one of the most secure prisons uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, he's quite isolated there, uh, basically in solitary confinement. Uh, and uh, the kind of pressure he's undergoing was shown precisely last year when he had a stroke. But compared to Belmarsh prison, I think a U.S. high security prison would be a death sentence for him. Uh, and this is what his lawyers are saying. This is uh, why they are appealing. Uh, uh, this is something what many people and organizations around the world, from Amnesty International uh, to Courage Foundation to, to many Nobel Prize winners, politicians all across Europe, uh, are also seeing and claiming that extraditing him to the United States would be a dead silence, a uh, dead sentence. And what they already succeeded is to silence the man. And whether you liked him or not, his voice was one of the most important voices of the early 20, 21st century. We learned so much through WikiLeaks. You know, it's a library of not just war crimes, but of diplomacy, of politics. You know, if you read WikiLeaks, you can actually understand how politics or the uh, corporative sector functions. So I think we should really cherish and value that. I mean, like, leaving aside what you may or may not think about Julian Assange, the man, like, I remember when WikiLeaks was happening at, like, while the, you know, Iraq war was going on, and I would follow all this, and I would lose my mind about, you know, nothing the media says or does seems to move the needle. But, like, the what, what WikiLeaks put out there was a just about the only thing that made the U.S. and U.K. governments during the height of the war on terror uh, afraid at all. Or that it, it bothered them, and because nothing else the media covered or reported on couldn't be metabolized or then like reinterpreted, or like whereas WikiLeaks was something that was genuinely a break with the kind of consensual reality that they manage and govern. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I completely agree with you. Uh, and unfortunately, the Belmarsh Tribunal is mainly dealing with the United States this time because we are coming to uh, New York City. Uh, but WikiLeaks, for instance, revealed many important documents about uh, secret trade agreements, the so-called TTIP. They, uh, they, they also revealed things about the International Monetary Fund, about Putin, about Assad, uh, uh, although, you know, people were people. I mean, not people, but uh, uh, different politicians and secret intelligence uh, wanted to portray Julian as a Russian uh, Russia spy or whatever, you know, but WikiLeaks also revealed uh, 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 tough about secret documents about Russia or from Russia, from Syria, about Libya, about many so about many countries, about Frontex, about, you know, uh, how the European Union uh, is dealing with the refugee question in the Mediterranean, which is, in a way, a consequence of all our invasions. I'm not saying it's your invasions, Americans. It's also ours, European, you know. Uh, uh, it's uh, take Libya, you know, the role of France and Nicolas Sarkozy in Libya, but also the role of Hillary, Hillary Clinton in Libya, uh, uh, you know, uh, and then take the numbers of people who are fleeing these countries because of our invasions. Uh, and then in the end, you have a situation of rising extreme right-wing extremism, for instance, nationalism all across Europe, building walls and so on, because these peoples are coming uh, to our countries. Of course, they are coming to our countries because we destroyed their countries. Where else should they go? Yeah, I mean, what would you do in that situation? I mean, I guess like, 
just just thinking about all this, it's just uh, I mean, they're like the. These states, like whether it's the United States or the United Kingdom, certainly can provide all these examples of the things that will happen to you or like what power really means when it comes down on you if you color outside the lines. If you, if you reveal the conduct of the way the world is actually managed, the way the, war, the reasons our wars are actually fought and the people who actually died in them or suffered in them, this is what will happen to you. And I guess like my, my last thought here is like for, for the Belmarsh Tribunal, I mean... Uh, just like like how do you how do you take on I don't, I don't know that responsibility or just the weight of like providing the 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 counterexample to the example of like what these states will do to you if you if you fuck with them. Yeah, I think the counter is the counter example is exactly the tribunal. You know, if you look at the range of people uh, members of the tribunal uh, who are t- who are taking part in it now for already two years. You know, from Roger Waters to Chomsky from Edward Snowden uh, to uh, former Guantanamo detainees to artists like Milo Rao and others. Uh, I think you should just pose the question, would you rather be in the company of Donald Rumsfeld and George W. Bush <laughs> or, would you rather, yeah. or would you rather be in the company of Roger Waters and some of the uh, uh, clearest uh, and most interesting minds of our century and activists uh, who have some of them, like Tariq Ali, uh, he was actually part of the Russell Tribunal. He traveled to Vietnam. He was traveling there, collecting evidence for six weeks under the bombs. You know, would there be in the company of courageous people uh, than in the company of the war criminals? And I think this is a big choice. I know that many people cannot make that choice. Many people are forced to put their head down until they end up in shit. But to put your head uh, even if you can face consequences, is one of the most beautiful things in the world. I think that's a great place to leave it. Shreshel, thank you so much. The Belmarsh Tribunal it kicks off on February 25th uh, in New York City. Uh, for our listeners, if they're interested in it, if they want to attend, if they want to contribute in some way, uh, what should they do? Uh, they should go. They should go to the website of the Progressive International, uh, which is progressive.international, and then there they will find more information. Uh, they could also connect via some of our partners, which is DM25, The Intercept, People's Dispatch, the People's Forum, where it's actually happening, uh, and uh, many other organizations uh, who are part of it. But check out progressive.international. You can register. You will get a live stream link on Friday. And let's kick this off. Thanks a lot for the conversation. Thank you. And the, the links will be in the, uh, the uh, uh, show description. The, the links will be in the episode description um, on your website. All right. Uh, thank you so much for all you've done. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And see you soon. All right. Bye. Thank you for your, thank you for your time. Bye-bye.